We're back, and as the 2023 NFL season inches ever closer, we continue our positional breakdown series. Joining us to dig into the Seahawks' backfield is the Athletics' beat reporter and the National Sports Media Association's Best Young Reporter of 2021, Michael Sean Dugar. Let's light him up. I'm Jackson Bevins. And this is Cigar Thoughts. Welcome back to the Cigar Lounge. I am Jackson Bevins. And along with my soliloquist producer, Mike Barwin, this is the Cigar Thoughts podcast. Mike, how are we doing today? Feeling wordy, Jackson. Doing well. (laughs) It's uh, all-star. It's summer in Seattle. Feeling good. Big week for the town. How are you? Oh, man, I am still buzzing from last night. I had the opportunity to attend the Home Run Derby, and Julio Rodriguez had the place feeling like a playoff game, which I know it sounds silly because it was an exhibition event, and I was kind of expecting it to just be an exhibition event, but watching a young hometown superstar be so ready for that moment to set a new record for dingers in a round, and the whole crowd chanting his name the entire time. It was like every single bomb that he hit, like somehow the crowd was finding a pitch even higher than before. And so it was really incredible. And it is why my voice sounds like this. So those listening, I was going to (laughs) say, I apologize for the rasp. (laughs) That's okay. I think it was probably worth it. Seeing uh, Julio set the record for dingers in round one must've been crazy. Uh, It it was, and it would have been awesome to, to see him win, but you know, I was telling, my buddy that i went with and big shout out to jake summers for making that happen watching those swings in person i don't know how evident this was on tv but seeing those swings in person it became pretty apparent that this was vladdy guerrero's event to lose like that dude is just a monster and he didn't slow down at all but even though we obviously all wanted julio to win you know getting to witness that 41 home run first round the new record all that stuff was was super cool And since we're talking about home runs, we have hit another one with today's guest. After having Hall of Famer Walter Jones, sports media superstar Mina Kimes, former NFL wide receiver Michael Bumpus, and current Seahawks tight end Colby Parkinson, we're back with one of the best Seahawks reporters out there. But before we get to that, a quick reminder, you can still get your official Cigar Thought cigars directly from CigarThoughtsNFL.com. Just follow the link and place your order to get these extremely smooth stogies rolled with 13-year-aged premium Dominican tobacco leaf. Or hit us up on Twitter or Instagram, as many of you have, and we'll shoot you the deets directly. We've also launched our YouTube channel, where you can catch entire episodes, as well as video clips from each show, including this one. This is one of the best ways you can support Cigar Thoughts, so we are grateful for the few seconds you can take to subscribe and like the videos. And Mike, much like Julio in the first round, and Vlad Guerrero Jr. all night, We keep swinging for the fences and connecting, and today is no different. That's right. The running backs are on the docket in the positional breakdown series, and who better than to help us make sense of a dynamic situation than a man who is as close to the action as it gets. He covers the Seahawks for The Athletic, co-hosts the Seahawks Man to Man podcast, and was recently named the best young reporter by the National Sports Media Association. He is also a friend of the show and a great hang, and we are thrilled to have him back. He is Michael Sean Dugar. Mike, thanks for coming in. Appreciate you having me again, man. How you guys doing? We're good, brother. We are good. You're going to have to forgive my voice today. <laughs> a little uh, scratchy after being at the Derby last night, but uh, we we'll Oh, you were it. there. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Uh, I, I, I didn't make it, but I've, I do know the scratchy voice thing. I did a whole... <laughs> yeah. If you guys go listen to the athletic football show during the combine, uh, I forget which day I was on, but I was the last guest of of all the writers who had a top 10 pick, I had just gone out to like three the night before. Uh, I was at whatever the, I think prime, prime, whatever, the bar everybody yeah. go to the combine. I was actually hanging with some um, coaches from multiple teams that night. So I was working, but but I was, I was out. <laughs> and then the next morning I got up at like eight to play basketball at the YMCA with um, a couple guys, a couple other writers, including our Colts guy, James Boyd, um, and then did my hit with Robert Mays, and I sounded like Doc Rivers. <laughs> it was just, oh, man. And the info was great. The convo was outstanding. But I listened back to They posted a clip on Twitter. I clicked on it. I was like, oh, my God, I'm Doc Rivers. 
<laughs> so I completely, yeah, completely understand. I told Robert, I was like, I got to do it again with some with some cough drops or something. We gotta yeah, right. <laughs> right. Expand on the convo with, yeah, some throat lozenges or something. Yeah, man. Well, look, the weather is beautiful. Training camp is around the corner. This is kind of where we all catch our breath a little bit. But the Seahawks are coming off of a splashy NFL draft. I can't wait to dive into that. But how's your offseason going, man? Uh, it's been very, very busy for non-work stuff, um, okay. mostly. Uh, but I do have some work stuff coming, uh, which has been exciting. It's been good to just get away from football. And this is like a good time when I take the pulse of uh, the league. I read all mm. my colleagues. You know, I'll catch up on stuff. I've been enjoying um, KJ's podcast. Um, with KJ all day uh, with the nostalgia. It's just basically like Seahawks nostalgia should be the name of it because um, right. they don't talk about anything current. Not, I'm not complaining. It's just a lot of rehashing, which is fun. It's good to hear some of the stories. Um, they talk about Super Bowl 49 every episode. I'm not sure why. Like uh, <laughs> it's the full just, roster it's, coming through. Yeah. yeah. Every, it's like, um, what's that movie where they have Vantage Point uh, where they like all the different people, Dennis Quaid, I believe, is the star. Yep. Uh, and they watch it from a bunch of different, vi- the same sequencing, just from different people's <laughs> angles. That's what they are recreating for Super Bowl 49. It's like, how do you feel about it, Luke? Where were you? Where were you, Cliff? Uh, it's it's yeah. actually very. It's like this masochistic exercise. Yeah, I'm not really feeling that part of it. I need to text, right. I need to text KJ and ask, and ask him about that. But long story short, I've been watching that. I watch, I watch Sherm's pod because um, I'm just so. Uh, um, I'm so intrigued by all the stuff that those guys are doing and they're like post careers stuff. I went to the celebrity game, Doug, Mike and Cliff through. That was cool. It reinforced my belief that I could get five media guys to take five Seahawks. Like, I feel like people, people who disagree with me needed to be there and watch some of those guys shoot and dribble the ball. <laughs> and like, guys, they're world-class athletes. Yes. But they're not world-class basketball players. They're like, not they the have same. like shoulder high dribbles. And like... Look, man, I, lo- I love Doug. I think I'm very proud of everything he's doing. I'm going to go check out his community center while I have some time off in the summer, but watching him shoot reinforced my belief for sure. I was You're like, locking him up. You're locking oh them up. Oh my god! Yeah, 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 yeah. I was just, I was just with some, some players um, a couple weeks ago, and I was telling them, like, yo, you got it. Like, some of you guys are nice. Like, Drew Locke is nice. Okay. Like, nice, nice. Like, if Drew Locke wanted to, he could have probably played at Missouri basketball Damn. Um, instead of uh, football. I don't know how good of a basketball player he would have been, but the fact that he could have been a functional D1 basketball player means something. Like Bobby, yeah. I played against Bobby. Bobby's very good. After that, it's a drop off. <laughs> it's like, a, a drop off. Now you're asking guys like Quandre to play or Tyler or uh, forget who they usually pick as their guys. But it's like everybody else, not really worried about. They always bring up DK. It's like guys, I watched the All Star game when DK was in. You've seen him dribble, like yeah. just take the ball from him, you know. Was, but yeah, <laughs> well, watching the celebrity game reinforced all that. Yeah, well, you've been standing ten toes on that for like years, <laughs> like, oh, yeah. out there Very on proud. Twitter saying like <laughs> we take you guys down and and to their faces. I told Bobby that. Like I said, I was just with some guys. I told them that. Like I, the evidence is mounting in our favor. The more these guys do non athletic, non football things in right. public, <laughs> you know, right. it works. You see, guys, see Bobby try to catch the uh, who hit that ball? Was that Felix? Uh, the yeah. celebrity game, like yeah. Every, football player skills don't just translate <laughs> mm-hmm. to everything, man. No, man, that's great. You know, and and like I'm excited for the season to get going too. But you know, like we were talking about, also not trying to rush it along and just enjoy this exquisite Northwest summer. But the gears of the NFL calendar they never stop grinding, and training camp is coming up. We're about to learn. A lot more about what the Seahawks will look like in 2023. And we invited you in today because the positional group we're talking about might be the juiciest of them all. We're going to talk running backs because the Seahawks have invested a lot of draft capital in the backfield of the last two years. And a lot of people are wondering what that means. I can't wait to get your thoughts on all that and how you see this breaking down. But as we do, I also want to hear your impressions of each of these guys individually. And let's start with the man that Seattle just used the 52nd overall pick in. That is, of course, Zach Charbonnet, the rookie out of UCLA. Now, granted, you've only had rookie camp and OTAs so far, but I'm curious what you've seen from the kid and what your reaction was when Seattle drafted him. So as far as my reaction, it was very similar to when they drafted Ken with the 41st pick. Last year, I was like, that's a really good player from what I've seen. Um, But I didn't like the the allocation of the resources at the time, like based Mm -hmm. on what they needed. 
I think about it. After that, they took two corners and a right tackle, and both of them were basically starters, or all three of them were basically starters. Right. <laughs> That's right. how badly they needed those other premium positions at the time. Now, mm-hmm. Ken was essentially a starter too, but like in terms of which positions are more valuable, I mean, Tariq Damner played every snap, right? I think Abe started all but one game. Kobe was essentially a starter. Um, so based on what they needed, I was like, eh, that feels like a luxury pick for a team that at that time we feel like could not afford luxury picks. We felt like, or at least I felt like at the time, they had been building the right way. Take a left tackle, take an edge rusher. I was Boye. Um, all right, let's keep building from these premium positions, which you need to restock. And it was like, let's take running back. I was like, eh. I don't, I don't yeah. I'm not sure about that. I also don't know how much we knew. I don't remember how much we knew about Chris Carson at the time. Um, so it really True. felt like a luxury pick. I believe at that point we we're all, it's like, all right, Chris is definitely done once they take Ken. But before that, I don't believe yeah. that was as set in stone as it later became after the pick. So I say all that to say, oh, I should ask, also add, I really liked my running back one in last year's draft was uh, Damian Pierce. I watched yeah. him and I was like, oh, this is the best back in the league. Yeah. You can't tackle him. You just can't yeah. can't bring him down. He reminded me of Javante Williams um, coming out. Doug Farrar said the exact same thing. He oh, said, did he Damian, really? <laughs> Damian, he said Damian Pierce was the number one back in that class. Yeah, I was like, you can get Damian like in the fourth round and be straight. I also like the kid from BYU, uh, Tyler, I want to say Algier, I yeah. think is how you yeah. say his last he, name. He looked great in Atlanta last year, too. And, so yeah, I, he was like a fifth round I hear what you're pick. saying, but those guys, those guys are, are a very specific type of running back. And you know what? Fuck it. We're talking Ken Walker. Let's talk Ken Walker. Not so, bad. Yeah, I was supposed to talk. No, about. no, this is great. This is great. So the thing is, like, I believe that Pete Carroll believes in explosive plays. And, like, Damian Pierce, his, his ability, Tyler Algier, they're, like, you know, broken tackle rates and all that stuff are, yeah, are really yep. high. And they're very good at getting you three to seven yards. But Ken Walker was, like, elite immediately at breakaway runs and yeah. explosive run rate and all that stuff and i mean crying out loud the guy didn't start till what week six and he finished with 1200 scrimmage yards and nine touchdowns over a thousand rushing yards almost wins rookie of the year but to all of that he also struggled with uh success rate and he ranked near the bottom of the league in percentage of his carries that went for zero or negative yards so we can just kind of blend this conversation here do you think that like with him, they see a deficiency with Ken Walker that they needed to address, or is it more like, hey, we can't just run one guy out. Look what happened to Chris Carson. Look what happened to Rashad Penny. Like we need to have a good number two running back right there. I think it's a little bit of both, but the former is definitely on their minds. I remember talking to some guys at the combine, and we were talking about what separates a guy worth uh, like a first or a second round pick versus some of these guys that you can get later. And essentially, I'm oversimplifying it for for the sake of the discussion, but it was home run speed. Like the type of guys like Brees Hall, um, mm-hmm. who I believe went before Ken or around that same spot, got the right same him, yeah. juice as Ken. Brees can just take it. It could be first and 10 from the 25. You get the right block. Brees is gone. Mm-hmm. Right? And like Damian and Tyler uh, are not, whereas Ken and Brees are. And we we're and B. John Robinson is how we were actually talking about them. I mean, this coach at the combine. Um, He's the, he's the same way. It's like, all right, you give it to, to Bijan. It's first and 10 from the other team's 35. You might score. You might not even need no other plays. Like, he might house it. And that is, there's a premium on that. Like you said, Pete sees a premium on that. To be clear, this coach was on a, this was an offensive coach on a, another NFC team. Um, not a Seahawks right. coach. But um, he's, the coaching tree in Seattle is like, everybody knows everybody. So, yeah. he knows we were talking, we were talking through a Seattle lens. But anyway, um, that's the difference between some of these uh, back so I do agree for me it's just about like taking that spot versus what you also need um, mm-hmm. so like for this year I was under the impression that the defensive tackles draft was pretty thin it got thin like I was like whenever Keanu Benton gets drafted it's getting thin yep. um, I forget yeah, when that I actually happened I think that was like I think the Steelers might have got him at like 56 um, so after that it got real thin and I think the Seahawks agreed because they traded out <laughs> <laughs> After that, you know, John Schneider said they some of their guys got snatched up. I imagine that one of them was him. The other one, uh, they might have been waiting on day two to see if they could get Mozzie Smith. Um, the Cowboys ended up taking him, I believe, late in the first round. And there was another one uh, who I can't think of off the top of my head. But I feel like once those guys were gone, I was like, ooh, it gets thin real fast. And you're going to have to damn near reach for Cam Young yeah. um, if, if you want. That was my thought process. I actually did really good last two drafts kind of forecasting. 
how they thought the benefits of going to the combine, I guess, and staying yeah, out sure. at 3 a.m. Uh, with guys talking, talking ball. So I do think that after watching Ken last year, yeah, those numbers, Jackson, you mentioned, like Ken was like, it's not he was just like not so great at, you know, some of those runs. He was damn near one of the worst running backs in the league at yes. avoiding a negative run. Yes. Like, and it wasn't just because the blocking was terrible. Sometimes it was, right? There were plays like tried to run like an inside run against the Niners in week 15, and he just – Austin Black is just blown back. And as soon as Ken touches the ball, he's in Austin's ass ball. You know, like, that was crazy. I was like, what the hell? Um, there were runs like that. But then there were ones just like, Ken, this is power, not counter. Like, why are you out there by Abe when, when you're supposed to be in there running between, you know, the tackles? Like, so he he wasn't he wasn't consistently good at those. And it, it, rep- it represented itself in the numbers and how Pete Carroll talked. Um and then how Ken even talked after he kind of figured it out after the Chiefs game or in the second half of the Chiefs game. So, yeah, I think that idea of, like, we need someone to compliment Ken. Because, like, with Ken, the Ken pick seemed like let's double up on what Rashad does in an yeah. explosive way. Whereas this yes. pick, the Charbonnet pick, seemed to, like, let's compliment what he does instead of, like, duplicate what he does. Both approaches are fine. Um, it's just your roster needs to be really, really, really elite elsewhere for me to be like, all right, great use yeah. of that second-round pick. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that we're probably in accord in that um, you know the opportunity cost of using back to back second round picks on running backs is pretty high, and and this is where I think the conversation about the importance of the running back position gets lost sometimes is a lot of people see it as binary like you should never use anything before a day three pick on a running back, and I think I think that avoids that conversation avoids a lot of what goes into being successful NFL running back. Um, and it's a lot of stuff that even things like, you know, a lot of people see it through the lens of fantasy football and, you know, get upset with coaches because like, Oh, this guy is so much more of an explosive runner. How come he's only getting 40% of the carries and you've got like a Carlos Hyde or a Latavius Murray out there, whatever. And it's like, well, those guys do all of the things, right? They're not going to get their quarterback blown up. They're going to catch the ball when it's thrown to them. If the offensive line blocks for three yards, they're going to get three yards, not negative mm-hmm. one. Like the the boring stuff that is super important to actual NFL coaches. And Ken Walker is so exciting. I mean, he's a movie star running back in that you turn on a Seahawks game, you might see something exceptional from him, but you're not going to get that every play, not even close. And sometimes you just got to get three yards. Yeah. Sometimes you just got to go where – the blocks are and watching Charbonnet's tape. That's, that's what I saw. One, this guy graded out really well in pass protection, which is huge. He catches the ball really, really naturally, which, you know, I don't think Walker is as bad as people think at catching the ball. They just never asked him to do it. At Michigan state. Right. Zach Charbonnet did it and he did it really well. And he looks like a receiver. He was also, you know, from what I heard, maybe you heard different, but a lot of teams had him as the number two running back in the class after Bijan Robinson, and, you know, I, I could see Seattle saying like, same thing. Like we need this second running back. Like we cannot count on Ken Walker for 80% snaps next year. Just like you can't for almost any running back in the NFL besides like Christian McCaffrey and maybe Josh Jacobs. And so I think that position has always been really, really important to Pete Carroll. Yeah, I think, um, and to, to John as well, John Snyder, that is, I think in how John talked about this last, you know, he had his radio show in the lead up to the draft, which was very very insightful to kind of get into the mind of the GM for like eight weeks or whatever yeah, before yeah. he drafts. Um, and one of the things he kept talking about, um, and I talked to him, I listened to the show and I saw him at the owners meetings, and combines, I talked to him at least three or four times. Um, and before the draft, one of the messages he kept saying, we don't want to push guys up the board just based on you know, need. If we don't, you know, don't think he's as good as another player. I do think whether the Seahawks want to admit this or not, they probably did push guys up their board based on like, character which is not like the worst thing in the world um sure. but you can kind of see it as i've been doing some of the research on these guys and zach i think is one of those guys as well obviously they think he's very talented because he is but then you go talk to people at ucla or around zach and it's like oh this is a really good dude like yeah. he's gonna behave well oh it makes like a kid but he's gonna have the right mindset there we go that's the more adult version of that he's gonna have the right mindset if things aren't going his way which is very 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 important um, cause when you're a rookie, it's just, it's going to be hard, you know, Man, let's talk, let's stuff. talk about that because <clears throat> we don't spend enough time when, when we talk about NFL football, we don't talk about 
the freaking maturity leap necessary to go from being big man on campus to like, now you're a young kid with money, with expectations from your family, from your people. You know, a lot of these guys are hearing from uncles they haven't seen since they were young and, you know, all this stuff. And it's like, okay, you, you kind of get elevated within your family structure too, to be like, you're kind of the man now. And you got some money, you young alpha dude with some access. Now the ability to manage all of that and learn the new language of your position at the NFL position to do all of the things, being on time, all that stuff. It's, it's hard because we can't quantify it. We can't point to stats on Twitter that say, you know, he ranked an 87th percentile in maturity, right? Like right. you just, you kind of got to trust the coaches and, and their process and saying like, it really is important that we count on this guy to be on it in practice there for the meetings, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and there be accountable when you're not watching too. Like, yeah. can you just count on him to be there early to get treatment on his, his uh, shoulder or whatever that's bothering him without you having to tell him to, or remind yeah. him to like a position coach may do in college or to stay up on this or to stop eating that or to get off, you know, the call of duty and go to sleep. Right. Cause you know, just, so whatever it is, there's so many of these these other factors that are going to matter. What happens when he's not getting the ball? What happens when his body's not reacting the way he's used to? You know, he's going to get older. As he he rolled his ankle, but he, before in college, when he rolled his ankle, he could be fine. Like Zach Zach mm-hmm. could. You know, he finished out their Cal game, I believe, on a rolled ankle. All right, what if his body's not responding like that in the league? Um, is he gonna is he gonna mope? Is he gonna pout? Is he gonna lose his confidence if he suffers a major injury, um, which happens to a lot of guys, understandably so. Yeah. Um, there's just all these factors and some of that is just trial and error. So it's like being in a relationship, you know, everything's cool when you guys first meet, but like when she hits the fan, you guys still going to communicate and trust each yes. other and all these things. Same thing um, with just way more millions uh, on the line uh, mm-hmm. as well. So, and in college, the business of the, of the game is like implied, whereas like in, or it's, it's understood, but not really hammered down your throat. Whereas in the NFL, it's like, no, 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 this is your job. And we're telling you it's your job. So do your job. Like that's what you need to do every day. And that's not just performing well. And some of that stuff is tough. And I can see the Seahawks kind of pushing some guys up their board or a limp. Like that's probably why they didn't take Jalen Carter. Right. Like, you know, yeah. for reasons like, like that, you know, which is fine. Um, but in terms of how Zach plays though, too, Zach guys were just bouncing off Zach in college. It was really crazy to watch some of the runs. He wasn't even yeah. juking guys who they would just hit his thighs and just fall off. Yeah. Um, I, I posted some clips when I did like a little film look at him, the athletic, we can't use uh, film in our story. So I kind of just have to just tweet it and then mention it in the story, which is silly, but anyway, yeah, it is. Uh, he's had some really good runs against Stanford against Oregon. Um, he's just a really good athlete, really good balance. Um, Ken has good balance too, but it's in a different way. Ken runs really wide, kind of like Marshawn used to, yeah. um, with the really wide legs for the jump cuts. Whereas Zach's legs kind of, he takes shorter steps. So they're closer in the ground together. So that's why he has such good balance. Um, so if you do hit him, you bounce off and he doesn't. Um, very, very, very impressive. Not super fast. Like uh, like you mentioned, he's probably going to be a guy who always gets you whatever the uh, – so like there's a rushing yards over expected. Um, yeah. stat, I don't know, uh, Next Gen Stats has it. Um, I think True Media might. doesn't matter. Anyway, Zach is probably going to be right there at like 0 or 0. 0.1 or whatever, which is good. That like, means like if this run based on how it's blocked gets you – this that's what he's going to get you which is great sometimes you just need a single or a double yeah. um that that balances out can kind of maybe get in minus two and then get like 14 uh, on yeah. a run that was maybe blocked up to only get three or four so i think they're going to complement each other really well um and yeah i don't know how much i would throw to zach you know in the passing game i do think that throwing to like running backs should be like a, <clears throat> excuse me it should be like a Almost like a last ditch. It should be an outlet thing. I'm not only really designing and, many and of them has been, for guys. It has you know? been with Carroll. Like they've had three different offensive coordinators there, and none of them have made throwing to the running back a priority. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> it's just, it's just. Uh, I was explaining to my homie the other day about this because um, I was like, think about it, right? A really good yards per reception season from a receiver, like a running back, is what, like Chris, whatever Christian McCaffrey had in 2019 is probably the answer. It's like eight or something yeah. like that, seven point nine or something like that. That's a bad yards per reception season for like any receiver you yeah. know like tyler doesn't get any yards after the catch and probably still averages like 11 yards right mm-hmm. so i just rather it's just we're advantageous to throw it to the guys whose job that is you know who get more depth on their routes um 
if you're a running back, I just don't want you to be bad at it. That's all. Just yep. if I do throw it to you, catch it, <laughs> you know, which is what Ken's does. Rashad was actually very good at that. Chris Carson had an excellent um, hand. So they've got, they've had some good luck there. Um, but I, I'm more focused on what they'll do between the tackles on early downs. I do think Zach is going to be one of those picks where it's like, yeah, the allocation of resources wasn't great. But by week four, when he's like running over linebackers, it's like, oh, all right, I don't really care right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. It's like an off-season concern, but like, yeah, yeah. When, when the, I mean, the ball is going to a running back 30 times a game. Like, that's just going to happen. They're going right. to have the ball in their hands 30-something times every single week. You need that guy to to be a dude, you know? And so I, I'm, I'm actually really, really curious – how you see things break down. I know it's early. I think, I think OTAs preseason are going to tell us a lot more about this, but you know, you see around the league, very few feature backs anymore. And you know, the bell cow, they're just, the game isn't like that anymore. And you know, Derek Henry might be the last of them. And so, yeah. you know what I mean? And so you see some coaches, some teams approach it like, Hey, this is our first, second down grinder. This is our receiving back or third down back. This is our two minute guy. The challenge with doing that though, is your tell, right? It's you're telling the defense that when this guy is on the field, we are more likely to do this. And Mm -hmm. I think that what Pete Carroll has done, even going back to his USC days is he's really preferred to have two guys he can count on in a three down situation so that one, he's not tipping to the defense you know, what he's going to be doing and two, so you can always have fresh legs for a drive, right? Like, I mean, at USC this is what you saw with Reggie Bush and Lendell white, like Reggie Bush was obviously the superstar, but it wasn't like, Oh, we're bringing in Lendell white for the short yardage stuff. It was like, this is Reggie's drive. And the next one is Lendell's drive. You see that in green Bay with Aaron Jones, AJ Dillon, you know, the Panthers were excellent at it 15 years ago with Jonathan Stewart, and D'Angelo Williams, and I think that's what the plan was with Chris Carson and Rashad Penny. And I think that's what the plan was last year with Penny and, and Walker. Um, but injuries kind of derailed that. Do you see Seattle taking more of that approach where it's like, hey, this is Ken's drive and then this is Zach's drive? Or is it like, no, we want Ken to do these things and we want Zach to do these other things? Yeah, this is actually something I'm like quietly very worried about um, because it's not so quiet anymore. Yeah. Um, just because every year I feel like I hear a running back, whether it's Rashad or it's Chris didn't talk about this too much, which makes sense because he was quote unquote the bell cow. But like running backs need they they need to get in rhythm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very rare that they can just and this is this is I think one of Rashad's um, uh, one of the reasons he didn't come out the gate super hot aside from the injuries was just like he's not a guy who I right, Chris took the first ten carries of the game. Now it's the third quarter. It's our second drive of the third quarter. All right, Rashad, get in there. Well, it's like all right, well I need some. Need some carries to figure this out. Like, let me get like five, six, seven, eight, and then I'll hit that big one. Um, and he had some games where he did that a little bit. Uh, Pittsburgh in 2019, I think Philly in 2019 as well, Minnesota in 2019. So he had some, but if you look at those games, it was all the games he had double digit carries. Right. Like, look at the games where he's in single digits. Most of them stink, right? The numbers are not very good. And then I think there's a reason for that. And he talked about that again. Um, he cited a lot of what happened in 2021 to AJ and Peterson, which matters as well. Like, having AJ Peterson's presence there uh, mattered. Also remembering that he's 235 pounds mattered as well. Yeah. Um, but also part of it was just like, he was getting the carries um, and he was healthy enough to stay out there and get them and get that rhythm. He was a big rhythm guy. And he's not the only guy I've talked to a bunch of running backs over the years on other teams for other stories and stuff uh, where that's come up or just in passing or whatever. It's like, no, that, that matters. Guys need to come in. Like sometimes they can get lucky, right? Like I think Ken's first carry against the jets went like 60 yards. You know, sometimes that that does happen uh, last year. I, I mean, and then uh, I think Rashad had one in 2021 against the Cardinals. Like his first carry went for like 18 yards. And he pulled his hammy on that, I think. Um, yeah. But that's rare. Usually your first carry might be like two yards. And the next one might be like four. All right, But now you're seeing how they're playing stuff. They're, you're feeling how the blocks are going. And, and you kind of got to get hit. Oh, you, you definitely got to get hit. You definitely got to get hit. Yeah. So, and there's just not a lot of room for that. Um, I do think the Cowboys, and that you had some really good examples just now. The Cowboys are probably the best recent example I can think of, where Zeke and and, and Paula were just boom, 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 like they just they spread it out perfectly. Um, but where you see teams doing it well are the teams that don't have the 
the receiving firepower that Seattle has. That's where my kind of concern comes in. Because, like, yeah, it makes sense for Cleveland to divvy up the carries pretty well between Chubb and, and Hunt. Or, or for the Cowboys when they're where their best receiver is CD, and after that it's a huge drop off. Then divvy it up between um, Tony and and Zeke. But you ain't really got time for all that when you need to get the ball to DK, when you need to get the ball to Tyler, and now you need to get the ball to Jackson Smith and Jigba. Like that's that's a lot of where the ball might need to go more often. There might not be any carries left over for Zach to get in his rhythm the way he needs to, you know, we've seen over the years that Seattle does not run a lot of offensive plays per game. They've been pretty low. Um, yeah. you know, despite having really good scoring offenses last year and with Russ, they were, they'd be, I think one year they were like dead last might've been Russ's last year, like dead last in offensive plays ran, I think in 2021 and like number one in defensive plays. It was yeah. awful. It was terrible. Yeah. It was like that Packers game. Like oh, man. just, just like encapsulated everything. They were on the field all day on defense yeah. Um, and then on offense, they just weren't doing anything. So when you have few, so few offensive plays, um, it's hard for me to imagine everyone getting the touches they need to fill things out. And I do think if I had to guess who the odd man out and that would be based on the history of the team in recent years, I would guess it would be Zach, which stinks because um, Zach's really good. But you could also see how that happened last year. Ken didn't really get cooking, you know, um, last year until Rashad broke his leg uh, against New Orleans. Before that, Ken wasn't really getting a lot of touches. It was a few You're drives exactly here, right, there, man. you know. You Look, exactly even the Detroit right game that. when they scored a zillion points, Ken, I don't think had that many carries. I'm mean, in a Detroit game and they scored like 40, uh, which is in theory is a game where they run a lot of plays and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I'm worried about that. I don't know how that will be divided up. Uh, position coaches are who kind of do the in-game stuff. So Chad, okay. it's more of a Chad Morton thing than it is uh, like a Pete Carroll thing. They'll have a plan going in, obviously, but like you got to fill it out. You know, if Ken's hot. Sure. Are you only, are you only putting Zach in when Ken comes and taps his helmet because he's tired? You know, so I, I'm worried about Zach getting the touches when both of them are healthy for Zach to be the back they want him to be. So it's uh, it's well documented that Zach was the highest remaining player on the Seahawks board at 52. But how much do you think that Rashad's departure played in their decision to draft a running back uh, that high and to have the redundancy of a second quality back in the offense? Yeah, I think quite a bit. And it's Rashad's departure coupled with who was left when he departed. Um, the run game just was not clicking um, when Ken went down last year. I think it was against the Rams, um, initi- or maybe the Chargers initially. I know it was the Rams week 13. And it just wasn't there. I have a cut up on my computer. I think I, think I tweeted it out of like all of Travis Homer and DJ Dallas's runs, I want to say, against the Panthers. And some of them weren't blocked very well. And some of them were just like, okay, this is why these guys were day three guys, you know, not no shade to them, but they also weren't very productive at Miami. I don't think either one of those guys were um, in terms of just like raw yardage. They had good yards per carry, but not a lot. Like Ken ran for like 1500 yards at Michigan state. Like that's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's different, different, different levels. Um, you know, but I think seeing that uh, another good example would be I think 2020 when Chris Carson went down and against the Cardinals, I want to say in like week seven, maybe the, the run game just torpedoed. It was like Carlos Hyde and guys, and it just did not go very well. And then Chris came back and it picked right up. Um, so it's like some guys just have it to be a lead back and some guys have it to just come in and give you a little something, something here and there. Um, like Travis Homer, Travis Homer is good for like, all right, he might randomly have a 19 yard run. Um, you know, but a lot of, but he was also a guy who's, he would get like a 12 yard run on third and 16. So his yards per carry would look crazy. Um, his success rate would not, um, cause he obviously, hey, let first. him cook, let him yeah, cook. So like, uh, <laughs> actually really Travis was a really strong, I really wish I could have saw more of Travis as a lead guy. Cause he was like, he was built, he had the build for it, um, to end the, the, the breakaway speed. Like he took like a fake punt, like 70 yards to the house. Um, That's right. I want to say he's got he's got wheels. Um, return the onside that. kick. All of yeah, return onside <laughs> kick. He gets the Jags to the house. Had another fake punt that went for like thirty yards. Never forget, um, man. To the house. Yeah. So Travis Travis has some of that uh, breakaway speed. But yeah, I think it's a combination of losing Rashad, which I I feel like was unexpected in their building. I think they thought they could get him back, but also just who they had after him. It just wasn't a strong stable of guys who could carry a load. Um, in the event that someone went down. And as as unfortunate as it is, these guys almost have to expect the guy to go down. It do. Yeah. It just it just happens at the position. They had to they have to plan accordingly. The New Orleans game last year was just such a 
it was it was a perfect example of the how nasty the business is. Like Rashad broke his leg. That was really sad. A broken leg stinks. And then Ken took a 69 yard run to the yeah. house and it was like, oh shit, <laughs> they'll be fine. And then they were, yeah. you know, it's just kind of un- unfortunate. It was, uh, it, but it, I, I use that game. It just, that also encapsulates the business right there. It's like, damn, we're yeah. kind of screwed. Oh damn. No, we're not. Um, and then you just stop thinking about the guy who broke his leg, uh, which is uh, unfortunate. But yeah, I think not having another bell cow type guy behind Ken after losing Rashad. Yeah. They definitely went in there thinking we got to take, a guy, maybe even need to reach for a guy um, to make sure we get the guy we want. So if, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're, you're not seeing this as a, you know what? Ken's not the guy we thought he is. It's more like we need that depth. We need to have that second guy that we can count on. And, you know, you talked a lot about uh, Charbonnet's maturity coming out and like being able to trust him to be a pro you saying that is not necessarily you saying Walker doesn't have that. It's just we need both guys to have that. Is that right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they've they haven't. You know, some of these guys I don't I haven't been around them in long enough to know, but they haven't drafted a knucklehead in quite a bit, um, which is good. Um, yeah. so, sometimes you need them. Like Deion Sanders worded that wrong on the Rich Eisen show, but like it, the the sentiment there is not totally lost. Like if you right. get some dudes who are just like I'm the meanest, nastiest dude on the block. Fuck you guys. Like cool have him rush the passer <laughs> like, there, like there is yeah. something to, there's definitely something to that or have him play nose you know yeah. what i mean like there is i i'm not fully like against that like idea i've covered high school football college football and the pros and like now nah, i feel a problem with saying to that extent he just shouldn't have said that out loud um but there's definitely <laughs> something to that or if you get a mean nasty dude like that have him play left guard <laughs> you right. know, and, yeah. and just have him and just run behind him most of the game. DJ Fluker was like that. DJ Fluker was like, I whoop your ass, man. We're running power right to my side. Let's go. Um, yeah. He wasn't scared of anybody. So there just kind of is some, something to that. But I think that they've, that maturity has mattered to them a lot. Um, and kind of filling out how guys are going to handle the transition to the pros um, is, ask, is, uh, is mattered to them a lot because they want some of these guys to play right, you know, right away. You know, when the Legion of Boom days, it was like, yeah, if you needed some time, that's cool because you're a corner and we have Sherm. <laughs> we don't need you to play right now. Whereas like with Abe and Charles, it was like, no, we need some pretty mature guys because you might play a thousand snaps, you know, right. today. You know, and that's not normal. Every 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 rookie class is not, you know, built that same way. You know, Derek Hall, another like one of those matured uh, dudes. Boye, another one of the mature guys. Derek Young. Um, they just got a, a bunch of them. Um, so I think... In terms of how the running go back to the running back split, I really think I'm actually writing a, a like a piece about this like right now. Is I need them to decide what type of offense they want to be. Like mm-hmm. they wear hats inside the building that say "run the damn ball across the the top," which is fine. But man, the way the resources are allocated and where the talent is on this roster, they should be a pass to set up the run type of team like the Chiefs and the Bills kind of can be. Um, like let's come out in 11 personnel and if you go too high then we're running power at you we ain't coming out running power until you dare us to um you know so i think they need to i don't know if they've made that choice actually i know they haven't at least it hasn't been related to the players because that's going to go a long way it's subtle but anybody you guys have been following the seahawks pretty well that the messaging behind the building or inside the building has to be consistent Mm -hmm. like those guys the message has to be strong and the players have to believe in that shit because if they don't you get the 2020 season um where the guy running the show did not believe it, and other guys didn't either. Or you get the 2018 wild card game against Dallas, where the, the plan is we're going to run it down their throats. And meanwhile, everybody's looking at Dallas's cornerback room, and they're like, "Man, you sure? Like you're positive, huh? <laughs> yeah, like, you sure that we shouldn't was, throw it at?" That at was damn 24? near a breaking point for me that mm-hmm. that game, man, because they finally turned it loose with like seven minutes left. They're already down by two scores, and you know, I rest went with like eight for nine for like 110 yards yeah. and a score. And it was just like, you know, can't we build the whole plane out of this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and the, the, what's been kind of fun about my job is that like, and I haven't reported a lot of this. I'll just mention in the past and kind of like I'm doing now is that like, it wasn't just the fans who were pissed, you know, it was coaches who didn't like that idea. It was some players on the, on that team who weren't here anymore who were like, Mike, that, that should not have been our plan in 2018 to go in there and pound that rock. But like, we know that's what got us to the playoffs, but like, Look at Dallas's DB room. Look at our receivers. Throw that thing. We can do it. And 
Um, and that that's why I go back to the messaging for this team. Like, are they going to be that tw- heavy 12 personnel, 13 personnel, use Zach a lot, use Ken a lot, use the run to set up the pass, which again is fine. Or are you going to be like, we just gave our quarterback 25 mil a year. We have a $24 million a year receiver, another $17 million a year receiver, a first round receiver, uh, you know, money poured into our tight end room. It's like, man, maybe we should, uh, we should be an 11 personnel team yeah. and go out there and, and score 28 points a game um, and, you know, win the division. You know, they, I think that's a conscious choice they have to make. We try to balance between the two, I don't think, will work. I think they need to have an established identity, whatever it is, um, and which identity they choose out of those two will mean a lot for sharpening. I, I think Ken's fine either way, but I think the run the damn ball thing works in Zach's favor, whereas a, a more opened up offense uh, does not work in someone like Charbonnet's favor or whoever ends up being the number two tight end. Yeah. I want to, I want to pull on that thread a little bit more in just a second, but you touched on something that I want to press on here. That 2018 loss to the Cowboys, Mm -hmm. that, that one just, that one hurt. Right. And, and like you said, it was felt in the building. That wasn't just a fan's thing. Do you think that Pete Carroll, John Schneider and the rest of the staff took that to heart and said, okay, Hey, we need, to adjust or was it just like hey man we danced with the girl that brought us it didn't work out this time but this is who we are yeah it was it was very tough and it, the answer to that well if you spoke i just pete and john i do think that they wanted to double down on what they do um and eventually pete and those guys gave which is why after some lobbying the let russ cook thing was even able to happen um yeah. they did it like they took an off season they fought russ fought for it they got it and they came out smoking um and then the issue with it was that like the first sign of trouble um, being the Buffalo game. And I believe the Rams game right after that, it was like, uh, all right, plug pulled. Um, and yeah. it just didn't mesh though. <laughs> yeah. Like the plug was pulled in the messaging, but not the execution, which is then how you get the giants game where it's like Russ shoddy. They are sitting in these two high coverage to stop trying to hit the whole shot, right. run it. <laughs> and yeah. They scored like five points that game or something like that. Yeah. It was just awful. Um, was, and you could just see it wasn't, it wasn't meshing well. And then when Shadi got fired and, and Russ was pissed and asked for a trade and asked for guys to get fired, you know, you could just see why uh, the messaging just didn't, did, didn't go well there. Pete, I think at his heart of hearts is always going to be a, the running, the run game is inherently more safe than the throwing game, mm-hmm. which depends on what throws you're calling and who you're throwing it to, I guess. Um, but that belief, when you understand that his, as his belief, and he was on our, our Seahawks Man to Man podcast talking about that, um, it's like he just believes that to be more inherently safe. And when you view it that way, that's going to be your fallback. It's like if shit hits the fan, you're like, you know what? All right, we're going to run this thing. Or you're going to go into a high leverage game. It's like, all right, if worst comes to worst, we're going to be able to run it. Um, he's also of the impression that like if you don't kind of establish that, when you do need it, you won't have it. Yeah, which is interesting because you can make the same argument about the passing game. Well, um, too. Yeah, you know, it's fascinating to view it from his lens that way. Well, and that was, I mean that was as good an episode of Seahawks podcasting as I have ever heard, man. Like, so flowers to you for that. Like that that was Thanks. such a killer conversation, man. Get to peek behind the curtain, like that that was excellent. And you know, we had Matt Nichols on the show a couple times. A really successful collegiate offensive lineman. We were talking a lot about this two high safety shell defense that teams just started playing like almost universally around the league. And it was like, what's, what's the counter punch to that? And he's like, look, no one wants to hear this, but it's running. You have Mm -hmm. to bring those safeties back up into the box. And if they're going to sit out there in nickel and keep two guys over the top, it's only six dudes in that box. Like you have to get them out of that personnel. Otherwise you're not going to be able to take those whole shots that, Carroll has always wanted to, you know, for, for all his well-earned reputations being run first coach, he doesn't pass. I don't think, I don't think he's reluctant to pass. I think he wants to pick his spots and make those yeah. passes really, really count. And you can't do that. If the team's if defense is going to sit back and say, yeah, do that. <laughs> you know, like that's what we want you to do. And so I, you know, I, I give grace to Pete Carroll and to coaches who want to run the football because that shit doesn't show up in your EPA stuff. A pass is always going, you throw a hundred passes in a row, you're going to have a much higher EPA than a hundred runs in a row. But right. 
you can't throw haymakers all the time in a boxing match either. Like you got to set it up with jabs. You got to get in on the body. And, you know, I, I think that's just a crucial element of the conversation that isn't sexy in the analytics driven world. And I, like, I'm an analytical guy. I think there's a ton of value in paying attention to that stuff and, and adjusting based on what metrics can tell you. But at the end of the day, man, if you can't run, you're not going to win. So I do, I do feel them on that a little bit. Yeah. The boxing is the, the, probably the best, like other sport example that I think works really well. It's like, yeah, you can knock a dude out with a haymaker, but you, you need to jab him up first. You know, like you're, you're, you need to set up that punch. If he knows you're so. just going to throw uppercuts and overhand rights, like you're never going to land one. Yeah. And you're going to get knocked out. <laughs> you know, he's <laughs> yeah. going to knock, he's going to knock you out. You're going to swing. He's going to hit you in the ribs. You're going to fold um, or, or just hit you in the face. But yeah, I think the boxing example is really good. I'm an analytical guy as well, but what part of my job too is talking to the players to understand how they feel about things. And I've never played football. I didn't play it growing up. So I'm really, I really lean on the, the guys who are out there doing the stuff and like playing, playing run blocks. Defenders don't want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and that's part of the game too. like force your 255 pound Leo to play this block, like to play Charles Cross coming at him, like force him to do that. And then when it's time to rest the passer, he might not have any legs, mm-hmm. um, which you do see that happen to guys, which is why your defensive coordinator is saying they want to keep their edge rushers fresh because they know having to set the edge is hard work, man. I was like, I was talking to, there was a, one of their edge guys, this is probably a couple of years ago. I can't remember the exact year, but he came, he was like, Mike, man, all I'm doing is setting edges. It's like, that shit's hard. <laughs> <laughs> you know and this wasn't a rookie it was a guy i yeah. forget what year he was in but it's like, man, it's like all i'm doing is setting edges he's like that shit that shit's hard yeah. uh you know i remember uh talking to uh even just kobe bryant about that last year you know when he's in some of their fronts he's effectively a linebacker yep uh when they do is like the i think it's their penny fronts like five one front where the line only linebacker would be like jordan brooks and then they're basically in nickels so it's like five guys up front jordan and then five dbs and that Kobe might have to set some edges. Kobe's like 198 pounds, maybe. Mm. You know, I remember talking to him about that late in the year. He was like, yeah, no, nah, it's, it's real. Same thing with Ryan Neal when he uh, came in in 2020. He was like, yeah, I had to get a, a treatment regimen after he played that Vikings game in 2020 because he was like, they were in 12 personnel or 21 personnel running that ball, and I was in there taking on blocks. So I had to learn how to take care of my body. But that all, that all factors in. in that. And it, it's, ha- it's hard to measure unless you go – talk to the guys, and I try to make sure that I watch ball, I talk to the guys who play ball, and I look at the numbers, do all all three yeah. things, which is very tiring. But you, if you do all that, you never sound stupid. You know, like, yeah. I have a hot take here and there. Like, yeah. I can be wrong. I very rarely, to toot my, I very rarely sound stupid, right? Yep. Because I'm taking into account so many factors. I'm not just watching film. I'm not just looking at numbers, and I'm not just talking to old school football guys. Right, you do all of those things. When you open your mouth, you'll, you'll sound like you at least know what you're talking about. If, whether totally. you're right or not doesn't matter. You just don't want to get on here and sound crazy. Um, so when it comes to the run game, I do think a lot of people sound crazy because they're 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 running in one direction or the other, like fighting for one side. Either old school football guy, or you're the homie Ben Baldwin, who's running, but who's a good great homie. His website is rbsdm.com. So that's runningbacksdon'tmatter.com. Yeah. Right, like you're you're establishing what side of the fence you're on with yeah. the name of the site. Um, but it's a great site I use it all the time. But like I use that to say this, you can exist somewhere in that middle um, and understand where both sides are coming from. I think Pete's further on one side, which has frustrated some players and coaches um, at times. But I think at the end of the day, when he's you know got a Super Bowl ring and NCAA championships, and he's been coaching longer than some of his coaches and players have been alive. It's like fuck, we gotta we gotta defer to the gray haired man. Um, as KJ Wright will call him, and you know, at the end of the day, he's he's right. He's got the hardware and the wins over the last thirteen years, or whatever, to to get and, the benefit of the doubt. And you know, to to Carol's credit, you look at Seattle's neutral game scripts over the last few years; like they're middle of the pack. You know, it's yeah. not like they're bottom five in pass rate. They're they're not. And even after losing the franchise quarterback and bringing in, you know, throwing the weight of your team behind a journeyman backup, they still threw the ball a lot last year. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think they were 12th in neutral game pass rate. So, so I want to go back to that conversation and look, new information is going to inform new opinions. We believe in that. I know you believe in that, but where we sit right now, middle of July, 
let's assume let's assume this is Madden. And you can turn the injury settings off, right? Because injuries are going to dictate a lot of this stuff. But let's right. just say everybody stays healthy for the sake of the conversation. You mentioned Seattle used a first round pick on a wide receiver on the first wide receiver off the board. Mm-hmm. They used a second round pick on a running back. So what sort of neutral game split are you expecting to see in terms of run versus pass? And you can frame this as, you know, I think it'll be this percent pass versus this percent run, or where do you think they they'll rank in pass rate among the 32 teams? I think they will be in the top 10. I think according to Ben's site, it depends on who you want to use like true media or like a homie, Mike Sando at the athletic. Yeah. He has what's called the cook index birth from the let Russ cook season. He uses the first 28 minutes of the game. Um, excluded, so excluding a two-minute warning, um, and I don't think he uses the second half at all. Whereas I think Ben Baldwin's site um, uses the entire game, excludes two-minute, but all, but factors in win probability too. So you're not mm-hmm. looking at like because every team's going to throw on first down for down twenty right in the fourth quarter. Um, so depends on what metrics you want to use. They end up falling somewhat in the same area. Like no one's first on one of, on Ben's site in thirty second by the yeah. Cook Index, right? So. Either one is fine. I tend to use Ben's because I do like the second half too, because then that speaks to the adjustments that a team might make, um, like the Seahawks in the second half of the Chiefs game, for example, last year. So I would say they'd be a top 10 team. I just think that they're going to look at how these guys function in ca- training camp with everyone healthy and be like, we have to throw this. Like We, we got to be that team. got to be 11 personnel. They're one of the least uh, frequent uh, 11 personnel team on early downs last year, I forget where they were, but it was really low, like 25th or something like that, um, according to True Media. So I think that they're going to see the personnel and and try to live in that world. Um, the reason I say that is because of what happened in week three of last year. They went in with a plan last year. I talked to so many coaches in training camp last year. They were like, we're going to run this rock. We're going to have our strong arm quarterback, whoever it is, throw these play action bombs, a DK, and that was and the Falcons week three? Yeah, but well, I shouldn't say week three as much as just after the Niners game. Okay. After the Niners yeah, game, it was like, fuck, Gino can throw. It was like, we don't have to, we don't have to borrow the Rams golf offense. We can borrow the Rams Stafford offense. And those are really different. Like golf hmm. was under center, dress up all the plays to look the same, play action, because very few people throw a play action over out like Jared Goff. Like he throws that very well. Credit to, credit to him. But when the Rams got Stafford, they were like, all right, empty, shotgun. We're going to sling this thing. Um, we don't even need to play action because our guy, don't need, he can just uh, catch it, throw it, dice guys up. You know, I mean, they won a Super Bowl. So I think that the Seahawks went in with the the latter, uh, the former plan with the Jared Goff-ish type of plan. Um, that was 2018, 2017 Rams teams that were really good, under center, ran it, play action, all that stuff. And then Pete Carroll and those guys saw him a couple weeks like, hold, hold on. Wait a, <laughs> wait a minute. Gino can do this. Mm-hmm. He's got the tackles to do it. He's got the receivers to do it. And he's got the mind and the command of the offense, the line of scrimmage and the arm to make this shit happen. Um, so, yeah, I think that they'll end up, whether that happens in camp or whether that happens after a couple weeks, whatever, I think that they that's going to be the pivot. Or that's going to be either the plan going in or the pivot after a couple weeks. We've seen a couple weeks in for – Seattle has made those changes. You guys remember in 2018, Pete felt like they weren't running it enough after they lost to the Bears um, on Monday Night Football. And then what do you know? They became the most run-heavy team since like the Tebow Broncos for the rest of the year. So I do think they'll either go in with that plan like we need to be an 11 personnel team. That's where our best skill guys are on the field. Last year, you can make the argument it was 12 personnel. This year, I would make a strong argument it is 11. And if you're going to live in 11, you're probably going to throw it um, more in those neutral situations. So yeah, I think they're going to probably be like a top 10 team. I don't know what that would be because that where that where what makes a top 10 percentage fluctuates kind of year to year, but I would probably guess like upper 50s uh, yeah. would, would be my guess as, yeah. as a top 10 team, low I'd, 60s. I'd be, I'd be happy with that. And you know, one of the things that you're talking about reminds me of something that Walt said when he was on the show. He's like, an NFL season is built up of a bunch of little seasons right? Like who you are on week one is not who you are on Thanksgiving. And I think the ability to do both, you know, we want to go back to, to boxing, right? You got Muhammad Ali coming up and he was just flashy as hell. He was quicker, faster, stronger. He just light you up. I mean, it was highlight reel knockouts, right? But when it's time to face George Foreman, he knew he wasn't going to be able to do that. Right. So he got in, he got grimy for nine rounds. He just 
in the clinch, body shots, just eating punches, wearing the dude down, the, the type of football Pete Carroll wants to play, right? Wear you down, wear you down, beat you with explosiveness in the fourth quarter. And you don't want to lose the ability to do that or the mindset to do that because there will be games. You're playing the 49ers late in the season. You know, you're playing some tough teams late in the season. They got a gauntlet around Thanksgiving that's going to be brutal. And they're not just going to be able to light those teams up through the air, most likely, right? So you do still need to retain the ability and the mindset to say, you know what? In order to win this thing, we're going to have to get in the clinch. Yeah, and I think with the Niners in particular last year, they were a really good example of like, yeah, it's really great to outscore the Niners. Like, if you do that, kudos to you. But that's one of those games where I'm like, where I would go in if I'm uh, last year, and I, you could tell they try to do this a little bit. It's like we honestly just need to not fuck up. Yeah. Like I'm really not a proponent of playing not to lose. Like I do think when you are a run first team, you are doing a little bit of that. And even Pete Carroll on our podcast, if you listen to his response when we did talk about the run game, that was essentially like if we just hold on to the ball, the other team can't have it, then we just won't lose. You know, it's like well. Ah. You can also go win the game, you know, like, yeah. but I, I get it. Cause you, you really don't get fired if you don't lose. Right. In, in this job, you know, survival, you know, so I, I get it, but I guess the Niners though, I would understand if you just like, let's just go out there and protect the ball. Cause if we do that, we probably can beat these guys because mm-hmm. if they get the ball, oh boy, they're going to score. And that, and yeah. you see how the floodgates just opened um, in the second half of that game. So I, yeah, I think, Playing it safe is like not the way to go, but then there are some games where the other team just has more talent than you, and that happens. And I know these guys understand when that is. Like as much as everybody's got egos and stuff like that, and you believe in your brother next to you, that's fine, yeah. cool. You can see the Chiefs coming sometimes, or even that 2017 Eagles uh-huh. team that came in here in Sunday Night Football to the Seahawks beat by two touchdowns. Uh, but like you, sometimes you just know. The 2018 Chiefs when they came here, like oh, all right. We need to be smart about this. They ended up getting in a shootout with Mahomes, which God bless them, they won that. But that's not what you want to go in right. thinking. Same thing when they played the Chiefs last year. It's like, woof, this offense is crazy. Let's be <laughs> smart about how we take care of the ball because yeah. there are some dangers to throw in even the safest of passes, right? This is a team that threw a pick six on a screen pass in the playoffs, right? So, like, <laughs> how many safe throws are there, really? Yeah, um, so, like, I, I disagree with Pete on a lot of it, but there are some teams, like you mentioned, that – December, November gauntlet where you get like Philly, Dallas, the Niners twice. Yeah, dude, another, it's yeah, ridiculous. It's, you have to, you, those are some of these, be some games where it's like, honestly, we can't really afford to fuck up. Mm-hmm. Like we can't afford a strip sack. We can't afford uh negative plays. Uh, we can't afford uh, to squeeze a ball in a tight window if it gets tipped or something like that, because that's the one player. You're gonna not going to win on third on third and eight against those teams. No, you can't really. be in third and eight against those teams. No, no. I do think I know we're talking about running back Jackson. Though I don't know. I'm trying to project. I'm going to ask Mike Sando how I can do this. I really want to like find a good way to quantify a th- a third receiver season. Like how y'all can quantify what that should be, what the expectations that should be. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to figure out how Jackson could maybe do in his rookie year but like if he's just david moore in 2020 who caught a shit ton of touchdowns um and moved the chains quite a bit like that would be really helpful for the third down offense which has been bad no matter who the quarterback is yeah, that's true. <laughs> going back a few years like gino was i watched a lot i have a third down cut up and i'm like Phew, you're just sitting there waiting for somebody to get open um yeah. and it just wasn't wasn't happening so hopefully jackson fixes that if he does nothing else if he just catches a couple of touch, catches six touchdowns and has 29 first down catches probably a great great year you yes. know if he doesn't have a lot of volume. yes well and that's 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 the beauty of his situation too is like normally you're the first wide receiver off the board you need to come in and you need to be commanding 120 130 targets off the jump that's so so difficult for a rookie to do he's going to be able to grow into that role which is really really exciting you know uh before we get out of here i do want to touch on a couple of other guys you know we mentioned travis homer uh seahawks lost him to chicago obviously rashad penny has moved on to the eagles but they still got dj dallas there and they also used a late pick on a super twitchy little guy out of georgia and kenny mcintosh what can you tell me about those guys and what roles, if any, you think they'll have this year? I really like McIntosh. Um, I think 
this is, I, I don't know how you get guys to do this. They just drop when they run slow. And it's like, man, and all this age, we got all this GPS stuff. It's I know. Like, that I just know. should not happen. Cause Kenny ran really slow McIntosh. Uh, yeah. At least I forget what his 40 was, but it was, it was not, it was not good. I was like, might've been like four, seven or so, something that a running back shouldn't run. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, this is how you, this is how you uh, slip to the seventh round. I really like him. I think he's got the, the same type of bounce as Ken um, and bounce isn't really which how you describe running back. Some guys just kind of have it. Yep. Um, I just like, and I like his attitude too. Um, Cause if you guys heard Ken's, I think they put out the audio of Kenny McIntosh's draft call. Um, oh just, yeah, oh, man! It was, just, it was in real time. Like he sounds like one of our really good friends from South Florida. He sounds just. I sent him the audio. I was like, bro, this is you. They just drafted you. It's like all this <laughs> saying you feel me after every sentence. Like, bro, this is the South Florida dude, true and true. Um, but like he's got that attitude. He even said, independent of his accent or everything, he was just like running backs or linebackers don't want it with me. It's mm-hmm. like they don't want to be on that island with me because they know how I'm going to get busy. And I love that that attitude. DJ Dallas has that in him um, as well. He's kind of bouncy too, um, but not not as much. I think Ken's, Kenny's a little slimmer. But I love what he's going to bring, man. I just think that – I don't know how much he's going to get um, with everyone healthy, mm-hmm. but maybe not even this year. Maybe like next year because I think DJ's in the final year of his deal. So like next year, Kenny's the, the main third down guy, and he just has some plays where he just gets busy. He just, you know, saves some games and some two minute drills with some dump offs where, you know, Gino's throwing it to him, but he makes two guys miss, picks up what could be eight yards and 10, turns it to 30. Now they're in field goal range, win the game. You know, plays like that. I don't think he's going to be like Darren Sproles or, you know, Christian McCaffrey or incarnated or anything like that. But I just think that he's got the juice that he has when he gets the ball in space. Um, I think that's going to be, it's not, it's not going to be a high volume position for right. him, but it's going to be like, man, when he does touch the ball, they're going to be like, wow, we should give the ball to Kenny more. It would be one of those things on Twitter, probably in the preseason too. It's like, man, Kenny yeah. McIntosh should be our guy because he's going to have some runs where he just runs through like the Vikings pre, you know, third stringer or something like that with a bunch of juice juking guys. And you're like, oh, man, this guy's cold. Uh, I really I really like what he brings. His, his attitude and DJ's attitude are going to go really hand in hand. Like DJ is like a warrior for real. DJ thinks yeah. like every game. Remember I said like some guys like before the game, they'll be like, All right, well, this team might be more talented than us so we got to approach it a certain way there's none of that dj dallas dj dallas like we're about to go fuck up the other team it doesn't really matter who it is because <laughs> yeah. all we got to do is do a b and c and we got this every game i remember like i that. remember daryl taylor t- talking like that too like same kind of guy we're we gonna whoop their ass today <laughs> you know? yeah yeah i forget he said that in college uh, he did who they, yeah, yeah. Who they it, it was like in the tunnel and some it was like a student reporter it was like what do you expect from from today's game? He's like, we're gonna whoop their fucking ass. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. And and you need those guys. Again, so you have yeah. those guys rush the pass. Um, but you know, obviously those guys can play wherever. But like I think DJ's got that. Um, Kenny's got that. Um, they ha- it just balances out, which is really cool because Kenny or Ken Walker and then Zach are really like mild mannered for the most part. Um, if you get them fired up in a game, they might sure. you know, swing on somebody, um, which Zach damn near did against Stanford. But for the most part, they're pretty mild mannered. Whereas DJ and Kenny, it's more like nah, nah, nah. The smoke we want it, which is great. It's great balance in that in that running back room. I think they have a really good room. I don't. I know that. Uh, I think like who is it? Mike Clay, ESPN does like positional like rankings of every team. I don't know where yep. they had the Seahawks. I would probably have the middle of the middle of the pack if you talk about the entire room. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas if you just talk about their top two, I think their top two is really good. But yeah, I think. That's why that, that decision they're going to have to make is so fascinating. Do you want to be that 2018 yeah. Seahawks? Do you want to be 2020 Seahawks? Like, there's an argument in either direction you can win in either scenario. You just have to establish the identity and stay consistent with it. Um, otherwise, it can get lost um, and get the guys to buy in with whatever decision you make. Because they, the, they got the horses, man. They, they, with, between Zach and Ken, they got them. And then on third down, they they got him as well. Like this this is an offense. Uh, I was telling somebody this was like a couple months ago. Somebody was on the team. I was like, you guys should score like twenty seven points a game. Twenty seven, twenty eight should be. I don't know what you, he didn't tell what their ideal number was. I don't think they had one, but I was like, twenty eight, twenty seven should be your number. Like it should be a four touchdown. Team Here's the thing: teams that score twenty seven points a game win eleven games a year. They just yeah. do. They just do. Yeah, so I think that's what I think they were at twenty three last year, something like that. Uh, they were like a top ten scoring offense. Yeah, b- uh, bump that up. Like you can get there. They had some. They had some stinkers against the Niners. Um, but like 
bump those up. I think that this could be one of the better offenses uh, in the league. Definitely a top 10 scoring offense, but they should shoot for like top five. Like I said, 28 points should be the score 28 points a game. Like you said, you're going to, you're, you're, you should win your division. You, you score that many points tonight. They got the dudes for it, man. Yeah, they do. I'm a little, I'm, I think I'm, this is the most, ta- the most offensive talent they've had in the Pete Carroll era. Yeah. Ooh, that's a fun one. The 2017 team had some talent at the time. We didn't maybe view it that way at the time because P. Rich didn't pop. He didn't pop until that season, so maybe not was viewed as it. But that had Jimmy, P. Rich, Tyler, and Doug. Jimmy Graham, that is. Um, And and Chris Carson uh, on that team as well. Uh, That was really – it just got overshadowed by Eddie Lacy and stuff. But that team was really (laughs) good. That team was really good too. Yeah, but this one – this is definitely the best receiver room they've ever had. Uh, sorry, Doug, but this is the best receiver room they've ever yeah. had. Uh, tight end room is probably pretty even. Um, and I know you guys should talk to Colby. Their tight end room is pretty, it's like solid. Like, I think the Seahawks yep. were the only team to have three guys with 300 yards last yep. year in the tight end room. Yep. Like, that's really, that means they just had, they didn't have anyone in the top 20 or something, but they all had a bunch of really solid guys. So, yeah, the offense is there. They have the offensive line, I think they have the tackles. People who know offensive line play better than me are pretty high on the, uh, the center they picked up, um, Evan, from uh, Detroit. So they've got it, man. They sh- That's why I think they should be an 11 personnel. Throw that thing. They should get new hats. I'll get them new hats. And say, <laughs> throw that shit. <laughs> you know, like, for real. Like, they can they can do that. Use the use the pass to set up the run. Um, you know, Kansas yeah. City's done a really good job of that, you know, even after losing uh, Cheetah, you know, like, that's – that's the blueprint I think should be is like, you can do that. You can still have run game as your identity. I had Pacheco in fantasy last year and won like two of my leagues, yep. you know, like Isaiah Pacheco, their seventh rounder. You can do it. You can still run the, you can still run that thing, even though if, you, if you're a, if you have a pass first mindset. So I hope that's what they do this year. Last question before we get out of here. Uh, I know they go by Ken and Kenny, but do you think there'll be any friction in the locker room, especially <laughs> the running backs room to figure out who the alpha Kenneth is? <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting one. I think, I think they just got to, Ken's just got to adapt K9. Yeah. Oh, it's like, so it's good. Just gotta man, go. it's K-9's, so good. That's a great, that's a great name. K9 as yeah. a running back. I mean, it's football. So any football player, unless you're the kicker, K9 is great, but like, being a running back and your name canine, just a dog, man. Yeah, no, I think yeah. that's what that's how they should they should uh they should figure that out. Although it kind of reminds me of when everyone was not the same thing, but like I remember it being a thing on Twitter, people would tweet me like, Mike, how are they what are they gonna put on the back of each Griffin brothers jersey? Like to distinguish them, like it's gonna be S you know, S H, whatever, like how right. I was like, Well, oh, the, the number is how you differentiate them. <laughs> just put Griffin on both of them, right? Yeah. Like, you know, number yeah. 49 Shaquem. 20, you know, the numbers are how you differentiate. I've always wondered about why guys put like extra stuff on the back. Like your number is how we know you're not the other guy, right? That's the yeah. point of the number. But anyway, yeah, Kenny, Kenny should just go with Kenny and then Ken Walker should go with K9 because K9 is a top. I don't know how many That's nicknames you have on this roster, but like that'd probably be one of the best nicknames on the roster uh, right now. Easy, easy. Listen, my man, this has been so much fun. We really appreciate having you on and you sharing your valuable time with us this offseason, man. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it every time you guys. Are, uh, I've, I got a lot of requests in my DM to do like podcasting offseason, and I feel bad for leaving a bunch of people on red, but I would not do cigar thoughts like that. Like, I, <laughs> I, 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 it feels bad because like you look at my DM inbox, there's like a bunch of ones that I just like ignored. And then at the top, it's like Jackson. All right, come on. I'm on. I'm on. <laughs> I'm on. So, yeah, anytime, uh, man. I appreciate it. Hey, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before we get out of here, where can folks listen and get more of you? And the Seahawks Man to Man podcast is available wherever you're listening to this podcast. Yeah, that's love a must that. listen. I love the way people do that. That's a good way to just say it. You don't even got to rattle off where your podcast is. Like, <laughs> right. If you're listening to this one, <laughs> it's there. Uh, so <laughs> don't even got to search. Wherever you're listening to this or watching this, it's there. Um, and then all my work is at The Athletic. Uh, my author page is just on my Twitter bio. So you just go to my Twitter. I'm not verified no more, but it's me. Trust me. Um, my author page is there. You just click on it and all my stories are there. I have one coming out this off season. Uh, I spent some time with a player uh, in his, in his uh, where he stays in the off season. So that was fun. Um, cool. I, I, I won't say that. the player. I'll, t- I'll tell you guys after we're done. All right. Um, all right. But yeah, that's just a little tease. It should come out. I start, the, start, the draft is already turned in. So it should just come out before camp. Love it. Love it. 
That's going to do it for today. As always, you can find Mike and I on social media as well. I am on Twitter at, at Jackson Bevins. That's J A C S O N. Remember that no K is okay when spelling my name. Mike is on Twitter at, at Mike Barwin, and the show itself is at Cigar Thoughts. You can also find us on Instagram and threads at Cigar Thoughts NFL and on YouTube, Facebook, and TikTok at, at Cigar Thoughts. Of course, you can listen to this show and read every article at fuelgoals.com slash cigar thoughts. And if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and you like the show, drop us a five-star rating and leave a quick review. Finally, be sure to check out cigarthoughtsnfl.com to get your exclusive Cigar Thoughts cigars or hit me up on Twitter. I'll show you the details. And when you buy those cigars, let us know what you think. Hit us up on social media with a pic. Let us know how you're enjoying them. Thank you to all y'all listening for your continued support of the show. We know you've only got so much time for podcasts in your life, and it is an honor to be a part of that for y'all. Please know that by sharing this show on social media and with your friends, you give us the juice to keep making it happen. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, onwards and upwards, my friends. Mm-hmm.